Apple and Microsoft are pursuing more patents and changes are coming to your television. Hello everyone and welcome to Tech and Coffee's Tech News Week. Welcome to a weekly series where we discuss the week's tech news and offer our opinions and takes on what it all means. I'm Duke Carico and welcome. Joining me this week from left to right is Alex Janko from Michigan, Andrew Rowland from Louisiana, Chris Jenkins from Florida, Guy Cook from Washington, Jeff Zias from California, Joseph Youssef. Joseph. Got a lot of noise there. Somebody just slammed the door on me, I think. Joseph Youssef from North Carolina. Matt Janey from Oklahoma. George Dosher from uh, signing in tonight as Tech and Coffee from North Carolina. And Yvonne R. from Florida. Hey, guys, welcome. How's everybody doing this evening? Doing good. Fine. We're all doing well. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Pretty very, good. very good. I'll tell you what, getting into this week's news. Pretty good, yeah. Apple has, uh, uh, in 2006, I guess uh, when I first read this, I was kind of under the impression that Apple had just uh, applied for this water damage patent. It's a water damage indicator. Turns out that... Uh, this uh, this patent was actually applied for in 2006, just uh, a month before the iPhone went public. Uh, what do you think, guys? Is Apple going overboard with these patents? Only a little. Am I, am I getting better sound, by the way? I was having issues just a second ago. Yeah, you're sounding good right now, brother. Perfect. I, I personally uh, was a Apple fan. I used the Mac for about three years. Um, there there are two reasons why I switched to a PC again. Uh, first was price, obviously, and second was this uh, the way they're handling business with their patents and uh, going forward. I, I think that I don't see any end in sight. I read an article about uh, since Steve Jobs leaving that it might change, but I don't see it changing. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's, it's I think it's the, it's how they're going to try to slow down the competition and how they're you know that's their tactic right now. That's what they're going to do. They're going to use patents and and start that slowing down like they try to slow down the Nexus. I, I don't even know what they're going to do with Microsoft at this point. I have a feeling that um, my, Apple's not going to have to do anything with Microsoft's reinvention reinvention of themselves. Do you? Uh do you, do you think this is a legitimate patent? This is uh, legitimate. I mean, uh, the last few patents they've got are are completely ridiculous. Really, Th this one, I mean, you know what the technology of a of a of a color changing moisture sensor. I mean, that's all over the place. They use it for pharmaceuticals. <laughs> they use it for cigars. Whatever you know, like uh, that's been around forever. Just the fact that they put it inside the back of a phone. I mean, that's just right. craziness that, that you could claim that as being something unique. They could just put that on a battery and say that's how the battery got damaged. You know, I mean, it's, right. it, is, it is ludicrous. I, I actually do remember, you know, those kind of checks with my Motorola's and, my, uh, and, and some of my other uh, phones from back in the day before the smartphone even came out. So I'm not sure how that got patented in, yeah, in the first really, place. It has been around a long time. I had it in my old, on my old Windows phones even. Yeah, my Palm Trio. Yeah, the only reason they're able to patent it is because they're putting it in the connector, and not just you know a small panel behind the plastic. A connector? Uh, huh? What's the connection? Uh, in the 30-pin dock connector is where they're putting the uh, actual thing that you see. Other than that, yeah. There's actually two in the iPhone. Um, I know this because I'm a senior advisor at Apple Care. Yeah, I deal with this every day. Um, there are two in the iPhone currently. Um, as uh, Alex was mentioning, there is one in the 30-pin uh, connector. Also, there is one in the uh, headphone jack as well. That's one that's kind of less known to uh, yeah. other people. Well, you know, I, I think I like to patent the letter A. <laughs> you know, 
I mean, because just because you can just because you can try to do the patent doesn't necessarily mean it's it's good for the public, right? So. It's almost like the patent office right now has n is is so bogged down that they're not even getting to the point where you can check to see if there's a patent that exists or something that's frivolous. It seems more like now, if you fill up the paperwork, it's only ten thousand dollars. We'll give it to you, and if there's a problem, you can go fight it out in court and let someone else deal with it. Yeah, pretty much. The patents are even duplicative. You know, it's a matter of who has the biggest stack of the patents for the same thing anymore. Yeah. Yeah, how can they how can they even tell the difference, right? How they will they even know? You know, it's just it's just crazy. It is crazy. I actually read something the other day sure. that uh, said that uh, Apple is responsible for sixty percent of the current tech patent lawsuits. So I mean, Apple is uh, uh, they're pursuing them. And, and listen, I, I'm going to say this, guys. Uh, if I was Apple. I would probably be doing the same thing Apple's doing, okay? I spent a lot of money. I've applied for a lot of patents over time, and uh, I've got some real competition coming at me. So, uh, you know, it, it might be time to uh, start playing my trump cards. Completely supportive if I thought they were doing anything new. It's it's not, I think, so much that that it's they're claiming a patent against somebody else. Or, or and you know even that has escalated to the point of stacking up uh, those common patents. But it's even beyond that, and these patents are getting completely ridiculous. I can't believe they're even being granted. You know the wedge shape on a on a uh, on a uh, on a laptop. You know to then you know that they can go after ultrabooks with that, and they don't even indicate it to be specifically a, a, a laptop. It could be any kind of a device. It doesn't have to be a regular computer. You know, I mean. These are really broad, simple patents. Like, I may as well go and start trying to patent the toggle button on a microphone versus a power button on a uh, monitor or a computer, you know? I mean, like, these are simple things that are just put in a context and given uh, unprecedented generalized patents. Yeah. I actually mentioned this in, in uh, our earlier episode of, uh, of Tech and Newsweek, in, in that uh, many lawyers... Who, deal, who specialize in patent law don't come from a technical background. Majority of these lawyers are criminal justice or, or some other bachelor's degree, then go into law school, and it's just one course that makes them speci specialize in, in patent law. Do you, do you think it's, it's the lawyers, the judges, or the patent office that's, that's really causing the problem, though? I mean, personally, I think that it's a combination, but the patent office is where it all starts, I think. I think it's the whole system. I think it's it's the whole system. And, and like I say, I, I really don't blame Apple, but I, I think some of these, I mean, you know, we've talked in the past about slide to unlock. I mean, who would have granted somebody a slide to unlock patent, okay? When when they blocked it, wasn't in Germany that they blocked the, uh, the uh, Samsung tab in Germany because it was rectangular and had a button on it like the iPad did, you know? I mean, they those are just. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. Patents. I'm sure there's some legitimate patents out there, but some of the ones here lately that Apple has, uh, you know, brought claims against these other companies. I just find them to be uh, pretty frivolous, and uh, that's just my opinion. The um, article link I put there in your chat, Duke, is from uh, last year. Wired magazine wrote a. Uh, published an article on how to fix the current patent backlog. Right now, being a patent examiner is uh, not a fun job. There's about a million applications are currently pending, and that was in August of last year. So you can imagine a year later, almost, it's even more. Um, each application can take up to 17 hours to judge the merits of. So if you're working a 40-hour work week, you get two done in a week. Okay. Okay. Uh, Congress knows that there's flaws in the system, but Congress trying to fix it. Enough said. I hear you there. So that is ACTA. I just wanted to share that with you, Duke, because I thought it was pretty on task for the topic at hand. I'm talking about patents in general. Who's at fault? Um, the people that aren't fixing the system are at fault. 
Yeah, I, I think we're pretty much all in agreement that, I mean, this whole system is broken. Is, is that a consensus here among the room? Oh, yeah, yeah. Definitely. of course, yeah. Definitely. And then what, the, what's going to happen is every, you know, major, you know, company like Microsoft or Apple or Google will have a team of lawyers just dedicated to do this. And it's just, you know, it's just, it's sad, but it's, it's, part, of the, it's part of the game now. It is part of the game. My question is, is this, is um, why can't they all just get along like the automa you know, automobile manufacturers do? That's my question. Uh, the automobile manufacturers don't really get along. It's just less common to see a lawsuit between the two. But that's another topic. Well, wasn't there a time, though, that the automobile manufacturers were suing one another for <coughs> technologies? And that yes. Yeah, sure. And that's Windshield wipers. And, uh, and I would think that... Flash of genius. Class, I don't know. Uh, I'll tell you what. Let's move on but continue talking about patents. Microsoft has applied for a new touchscreen technology. And uh, has anyone caught the video, the YouTube video, by the way? It was amazing. I, yeah, I did. Pretty impressive. They bought, they bought that company. Uh, yes, yes, they, they did buy a company, and basically, it's my understanding this patent uses a lot of predictive, te or predictive algorithms, and uh, uh, this is, a, is this a legitimate patent? I asked about this, uh, this Apple patent there prior, about this uh, uh, change in color when it got wet. Is, is this a, would you consider this a legitimate patent? I don't think so, really. Um, personally, um, this could be used across the board, and not only uh, smartphones, but uh, tablets as well. Um, and anything else that uses a touchscreen uh, uh, for its basis of use. Yeah. Well, what's? I mean, there's a, a Google does a lot of predictive, you know, technology, right? They they have smart actions on their Android phones to help you uh, tune the phone by based on your usage, based on how you use it. They have a predicted keyboard, guessing we're going to hit the next stroke. So, I mean, um, you know, is it so different to, you know, touch something and it be predictive versus, you know, on a screen versus on a keyboard? I, I, I don't know. A, a valid patent would be, instead of doing predict, a valid patent would be uh, putting it on a, a touch screen that was flexible and instead of a piece of paper. That could be patentable. That's a completely different new idea. But... To say something that you're predicting how to touch something, that, that can't be patentable, can it? Now, um, going back to the Nexus 7 that's, uh, that was introduced a couple weeks ago, um, at Google I.O., they were talking about um, the different types of uh, you know, technologies that's coming out. And within the uh, Google Chrome browser, actually, um, they're trying to load a web page that you might possibly you know, touch on in the background before you do that. So I, I guess that's some form of predictive, uh, you know, uh, screen, right? Yeah. That's actually already enabled since Chrome 16. If you go over into Chrome right now, you can start typing in a URL like Google, and it'll start to load the page before you even hit enter. Yeah, uh, th this actually uh, is coming to Jelly Bean now, 4.1 Jelly Bean. Yeah, there's a there's a comment from the YouTube chat. The, the Dante Boat is saying that uh, also the damn lawyers want everyone to sue, 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 so they make their money regardless of the outcome. Shakespeare was right about the lawyers. So I think you can, that's what's happening. Everyone is feeling the same pain, right? Even the public. The public is definitely fed up with it. Absolutely. Okay. Uh let me ask you this: If uh, if you saw this uh, predictive al algorithm show up in a in a Microsoft tablet, do you think this is uh, the type of technology that uh, is going to help Microsoft? Uh, you know, Microsoft's got an uphill battle, even though they've been making tablets for you know they were displaying them. I don't know if you guys ever remember the uh, HP slates that really never came to production. But uh, is this the type of technology, this uh, 
predictive algorithm where it's going to, it kind of knows where you're going to go next, and it's going to preload all this information to keep things nice and smooth and slick. Uh, do, does this give them an edge over the competition? Really, I think, I think it might stifle them, really, um, because we're at the point now where data transfer, like, for example, on a web page, we're at the point now where data transfer is having a hard enough time keeping up with the actual devices. So I think on, on web usage, I think it actually might stifle them. I think it's going to be a tough road in the short term. I'm really excited to see them innovating again and pushing things forward, but they're still, I think, missing the mark a little bit on the market, you know. If, if they're banking on this to, to get, a, you know, a return in the first quarter of next year or something, you know, I don't know if, if they're going to be seeing very quick returns on it. If they're looking uh, for a real long-term plan, then I would say they're on the right track. If they're trying to get uh, returns fast, I think they're going to be disappointed, and, uh, you know, I worry they'd, they're, they're going to slide. But again, I think they're, they are, you know, business-oriented, not consumer-oriented, you know, sometimes. So I think a lot of their technology, like the Surface, is like enterprise, and this new, the company they bought is kind of like that wolf blitzer on the big screen board, you know, moving um, elements on, on, a, on a LCD screen. Um, maybe they're positioning themselves for more of that kind of marketplace, more business, more big business. High profile, like big flashy stuff for presentation. I mean, that might be a really good niche market for them, actually. Ex exactly, you know. Well, the way Microsoft is Bad trying to reinvent, reinvent itself as a tablet that could be a laptop, I think it's very different from what iPad or, or anything else has done. So, you know, if they market it right and it really is as productive as the way they're toting, they might have something. Yeah, I mean, if it if it lives up to what it what it looks like in the keynote and and all the examples, uh, and it, it's at the right price point, I'll be purchasing one. I can very easily see it being the laptop killer, assuming, of course, that they do it right. You know, but Microsoft just said that uh, Apple has it wrong that it's not it's not a post PC era; it's a post or it's a PC plus era. Meaning that you know they they're talking about you know basically what the what what the slate is or surface or whatever the name is you know. I, I had to laugh, Joseph, when you said uh, it's a it's a PC killer. You know, I hate to say it, I think Vista was a PC killer, laptop killer. <laughs> you know, uh, you know. So I think uh, they have to they have to definitely get their their act together when they come out with Windows 8. Make sure it's rock solid because they can't have a big mix up. You know, like they they really need to have two big wins. You know, the, this is a turning. You know, really though, when when you're talking about that, I mean, uh, uh, you you guys know me. You know how I love my my gadgets. Okay, and yeah, we can talk Android phones and we can talk uh, iPhones and uh, Android tablets and and iPads. You know what? Every one of us right here, right now, are hanging out from a computer. Okay, we're not hanging out from a gadget, even though we can or we could. We're hanging out from a computer. So I guess what I'm saying is as cool as these gadgets can be, and they can do some amazing things nowadays, okay, when you really want to get real work done, you go to your PC. I'm sorry. That's a, that's a good point, Duke. You know, and I think, you know, looking at Microsoft from their big thinking, I think they're on the right track. Uh, you know, obviously this whole gadget market has spread out and we've kind of got this simplified interface and it's bringing actually new people into uh, interacting with technology, you know. But the problem is, is these markets are kind of diverging. I mean, we have these things and they're more toys to us, but like you say, when it comes down to real business, we're getting back on a machine that's a, a, you know, a regular PC or a Linux machine or a Mac, a Mac machine, but like a real deal computer and not a tablet and not, uh, you know, a uh, a phone or a ultra portable tablet, you know, we're getting back to the real deal where we want juice and we want a full operating system on it. And yeah. to offer both of those things would be bringing those markets back together. It seems like Metro, the idea of that was to take that touchscreen sort of simplified interface and combine that with the full operating system like we're used to, you know. And, you know, I think in the big thinking, they're on the right track. I'm just very skeptical of Microsoft's implementation just because of, you know, their history. <laughs> Microsoft. Just to dovetail on what Duke says, how many people here have dual monitors, right? I mean, 
holy moly, it makes life so much easier. You're not going to have dual monitors on a small little... Right. You know, no, you're ever. not. But, but you know, who is the majority of the consumer? The business market has its own niche. It's just, you know, with all the iPad and, and all the other, you know, latest and greatest fads out there, it doesn't even come close to touching anything that's business. So for Joe Consumer, well, why not deal with a little bit of entertainment that can do some light duty work as well? And that's where I think Microsoft's Surface really might come into play. I, but, I, I, you know, how does it apply to the real business? I don't know. But I, it's definitely somewhere where Apple just can't go. May, may I think interrupt one last time real quick? Sorry, there's, there's something from the um, YouTube chat again. This guy, Dante Boats, put in Zoom, Bing, Vista, Microsoft Bob, Windows ME, <laughs> Microsoft Smart, <laughs> Watch, MSN Music, and Play for Sure. <laughs> so <laughs> he named all the winners there, so that was great. <laughs> we also forgot MSN TV, by the way. Um, Google has had as many flops, though. That's true. They okay. introduced many things that, that flop. Yeah, that's true. I do think that uh, Microsoft does have something with this. Um, they'll be able to reach into a, a, a number of different markets with this, though. Um, as we were seeing on the video, um, the squiggly lines you know, that were going down the screen that were taken with a high-speed camera. Um, that's going to be excellent for the artistic community, you know, the uh, construction community even. Anybody who has to do any kind of drafting, you know, any types of drawings, it's going to be excellent for them uh, due to the fact that they're pretty much going to have real-time at your fingertips uh, uh, line drawing pretty much, which is really nice. You know, like you mentioned, Google having a lot of misses. You know, one of the things about Google is where they do have flops, they have a lot of really good innovation that they then bring forward into new projects. You know, when, when we saw, uh, uh, you know, some of the things from, from Buzz, some of the things from uh, Wave, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, multiple editing, you know, and highlighting and real-time uh, collaboration stuff from Wave, all that stuff's now integrated into Google Docs. I mean, they brought a lot of that stuff forward, so they didn't have a lot of loss in that innovation. I think they're just, the way they tried to roll it out and market it might not have worked. And if that happens with Microsoft and they're willing to still be innovating, they'll still have new assets from that innovation that they can go forward with. And I think that's what they're doing. I mean, if you look at uh, the change from Vista to 7, I mean, it was, it was, you know, that's basically what they're doing, but I don't think they used to do that. It's, you know, it's a learned, learned process. Now, if they took the arrow resources and took the arrow programs and loaded them into Metro UI through a simple conversion process like, you know, hiding the menu element through Visual Basic into the bottom bar and things like that, then we might actually like Windows 9. But until that happens, Windows 8 is not going to work. Not for the average consumer, not for the pro consumer. The only way that it's going to slightly work is on laptops and x86 tablets. So, so 40 bucks is not going to make you um, upgrade. It's going to make me upgrade. 40 bucks. Totally. Yeah, 40 dollars uh, for the upgrade in Windows 8. Yeah, right? yeah, I'm going to try it. Yeah, uh, I, I would upgrade myself too. I mean, I, I'm a Linux guy, but I do have some Windows machines that I I play with and experiment with for for that low price. I mean, I paid $59 for Red Hat, so why wouldn't I pay $40 for Windows to play with? And I, I, I buy uh, Zuse. I buy Zuse Linux. I paid 40, I think it was $44 for a Zuse disk with support. So, I mean, if I buy Linux, which is a free product, why wouldn't I buy something that actually costs money and play with it? And I'm a Linux guy, so. I'm going to be staying on Linux, though. Uh, I'll be bouncing in between Ubuntu and uh, uh, Linux Mint, probably. I'm going to hold out, sit back, listen to the reviews, and see what goes on there. Because it's, it's going to be hit or miss, I think. If they get it right, I think it's going to be huge. And if they don't, I think there's going to be a whole lot of people that are uh, going to uh, not feel the, uh, the, the pain there. Yeah, I'm going to hold off and let you guys try it first and tell me how it goes. <laughs> then, I'm, then I'll be glad to fork over $40 and be perfectly yeah. happy doing it if it... Seems to be working out just fine. 
Okay. I, I still feel the same way. Like the menu bar faded away, and all the visual basic elements converted to Metro. That would be so simple for them to do, but yet they don't. Okay. Let's let's move on. Let's move on. We got a lot to cover, guys. Okay. So let's let's talk a little bit about TV viewing. Uh, Netflix announced this week that its viewers have watched over one billion hours of video over the course of June. Just in the month of June, one billion hours of video. That's about one hour per Netflix subscriber per day. Okay? So, uh, you know, probably each hour of Netflix viewing means that uh, people are spending one less hour of watching your regular old live standard TV. And just a question to the group. Has your TV viewing time changed in the last five years? Yes, Duke, actually. Um, I killed cable completely. I don't have cable anymore. I have an antenna that's on all the TVs. I think it's a complete waste of $120 to pay a cable company to watch stuff I can watch streaming off something I pay $50 a month for. I was, I was trying to switch, Duke. But the entire viewing audience at my house said, no, we're not. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to use all these new gadget controllers and stuff to do all this Internet TV. Put us back on to the dish. So I begrudgingly put us back on the dish. It's a matter of education for people to evolve to that level, to be like George, to unplug from the cable from the dish and get um, Internet-enabled TV. Um, just the other day, someone told me about this new remote control from Logitech that will make that happen. And so 50 or $60 later, we'll know. Well, just think of how much time you put into Hangouts. You know, I mean, I, everything gets compressed. So your viewing hours get compressed for TV because you're in a Hangout. Or you're watching streaming on Netflix. Or you're watching Hulu. Or you're watching... Amazon Prime, if you have Amazon Prime, you're watching free movies. So, and there's movies on YouTube. People are searching on YouTube. So I, I think broadcast TV is, is in trouble. They've got to come up with some, a different model. They, they really do. They are, and I, I think they're, they're in a place where they're about to start getting fragmented when you've got deals that aren't going through with direct TV that's cutting out a, a whole exactly. slew of channels that are very popular. I've been trying to cut my cable for a while, but it really comes down to I pay this ridiculous price for five or six channels that are way up, a few tiers up there that are pretty specialized, and I can't get those in another place, you know. And if, and if they go, if they, if those specialized channels go direct, you know, find a way to direct feed the internet, and, and I could buy them that way. Boy, that cable subscription is going to be gone. And I think that that'll happen after a couple of the big ones do. Obviously, I think one of the biggest problems people have as far as cutting the cord is getting sports. You know, and I think ESPN with ESPN 360 is playing around with the right. direct delivery, although right now they're kind of playing with the cable companies, I think, so they can get away with toying with that. Because, uh, I mean, like, like for me as a, as a Cox subscriber, you know, I have access to that ESPN 360 because of my cable subscription. You know, but, uh, you know, if they go beyond that, you know, that's going to be a game changer. If HBO has been playing around with HBO Go, you know, if, if they want to sell directly to me, and they've had a beef with the cable companies before about a la carte uh, uh, sales, you know, uh, then that's going to be a game changer when a couple of those big ones go that are, that are having the really heavy content. Yeah. I think it's going to be a real long time before Netflix really becomes a big game changer. The biggest problem with Netflix and Hulu and all these other ones is that there really hasn't been a good product that lets allows for an alternative for the same TV viewing, being able to plug it in and make it just so user-friendly as the cable box or dish network box or any of those other like cable box or box type uh, of viewing. I think those providers are a little bit scared, and I think they're using contracts to try and maintain the power that they have. But as time moves on, competition moves on, the need or the want for a more interactive TV viewing experience is starting to occur. I think IPTV is actually going to be the future of where things are going to be going. People are going to be, instead of having um, subscribers that are being bogged down or locked down by 
areas or localities such as big uh, providers like Comcast or Time Warner, you might be able to get your TV viewing experience over the internet from various uh, locations, and your and those and those providers end up becoming some sort of background um, internet carrier instead. Well, who's the who's the who's the best out there for serving up? No pun intended. You know, advertisement on a local level. That would be, you know, Google and YouTube. If you had, you know, subscriptions to, to um, you know, subscriptions through YouTube, how perfect would that be? Yeah. You know, but, you know would, the upcoming Comic Con, I did a uh, post in the stream about Comic Con coming up, and one of the top ten things they're going to unveil is a show that's going to be on YouTube instead of on cable or Dish or Premier HBO or anything. It's produced by Warner Premier. The director is the guy that did X-Men. They don't invest those kind of dollars on a look what we can do. We're getting a glimpse of the future and what YouTube is going to provide us for comp content that's going to be top quality stuff. I think before any of these are going to be successful, uh, Roku and Netflix and everything, they're going to have to implement streaming. It's going to have to stream. People are going to have to be able to turn their TV on at 6 o'clock. I know we all love DVR and we all love watching it whenever we want, but there's the people, the average user, they want to be able to turn their TV on and have a live stream show without having to search for anything. I think you're absolutely right. As soon as, as somebody can provide the highest level of content for both full on demand and scheduled programming, then that's that's when you're going to get all the yeah. market in the same place. Uh, you know yeah. who the leader of this right is, right? right? YouTube is right there. They can, I mean, obviously yeah. do that. They're doing it now in this Hangout. Right? Yeah. You know, the leader... And, and also of, YouTube has their TV stations before they even started live Hangouts on air. People who are leading this in, this endeavor, sadly enough, is not U.S. companies. Our companies are, are saying they're trying to use contracts to hamper us. If you go on search for IPTV, you're going to find a lot of companies that are not based in the U.S., that are trying to provide that very same service for American consumers. Um, I can actually give you a perfect example. Um, I have a retired aunt who is a, is, is a you know a, a second or a first generation immigrant, and she likes to watch some channels from where she used to grow up at. And so she's paying twenty dollars a month for a service that gives her about fifty channels that are all over you know the world. That for her is just fine. And, you know, for $20 a month compared to what we're paying for our own cable bills now, for her, that works. Tell you what, yep. let's quickly move on to a related television topic. And that is that uh, this is uh, actually it's part of my rumor segment, but I think it's going to fit really good in here. The uh, It's uh, probably a little bit more than a rumor, but DirecTV is going to get uh, – Going to get rid of Viacom as a business and channel partner. And basically, we're looking at 17 high-profile channels that uh, either aren't on, uh, on DirecTV or shortly won't be. Just a second here. I think this is, uh, this is one that's already been true. Uh, <clears throat> You know, we're we're talking about uh, we're talking about 17 shows, and we're talking about uh, uh, Nickelodeon, Comedy Central, MTV, BET, VH1, CMT, Logo Spike, TV Land, MTV2, VH1 Classic, Palladia, Nick Jr. By the way, Palladia is one of my favorites. Uh, you know, DirecTV has got 20 million subscribers. Hmm. Is uh, is this going to hurt direct TV sales? I think so. Um, I, I due to the fact that um, some of these channels are very important to people. Um, not saying that I speak for the whole you know direct TV universe when I say this, but uh, if I don't have my weekly Tosh Point oh, I get very upset. I don't know about you all, but um, you know, not only Tosh Point oh, but uh, I can see where parents will be angered by this. Um, Due to the fact that you know Nick Jr. and some of the other Nickelodeon uh, channels will no longer be accessible as well, um, I mean that's that's a big deal because you know you know most parents nowadays instead of taking their kids to the park they what do they do they sit them right in front of the TV you know 
And when that kid decides he likes a show, he wants that show. Exactly. That, that could that could be the family's decision about changing their provider real fast. Exactly. Yeah, I have a feeling uh, Tom, or Dish just gained a ton of subscribers. I think that the, the straw that will break the camel's back on this, Duke, will be the sponsors. The people that are marketing in those niche markets, so the kids are on Nickelodeon, they got to be there to sell their hula hoops or their frisbees or whatever. They're going to say, okay, you guys get this ironed out by Friday, or we're going to find a new way to deliver our content, and you're going to lose that who knows how many million dollars of advertising revenue a year they're spending with Viacom. If, so if they can't hold out too darn long because all the players aren't on the, the same page. If, you're, if, you're, uh, if your cable bill went up 30% next month, would you continue to subscribe to it? No, I'm the guy in my viewing audience that wants to be off cable now. <laughs> I actually think this might be good for DirecTV and the, and, the, and the fact that at least someone is fighting for its cable subscribers. Um, all of these companies have been raising their rates every year and every year and every year um, with, and trying to negotiate war, uh, war, uh, contracts with those uh, cable providers. Well, it's been a recession. We've been taking well, hits. Well, why are, why are they enough. increasing their portfolios while well, everyone else is taking a hit right now. What Matt was talking about, the a la carte model where you could pick and choose which channels you want to get out of their folder, that's why it doesn't happen because Viacom says, okay, you want to watch Nickelodeon, that's fine, but you got to have all these other ones too. You can't just have Nickelodeon. And until they come to Earth with that kind of a, a model, I'll never want to adopt uh, having it be off the dish or off the cable because I've got 150 <laughs> channels I've never seen. But it's just an opportunity for somebody else to scoop them up and provide it, right? That's, yeah, that's like, what it YouTube. Is. like YouTube. YouTube's exactly. in a catbird seat right now. So, so is the consensus of the room that uh, the traditional television model is in trouble, soon to collapse? Is that what I'm hearing? I, I sure hope so. Yeah, I, I hope so. Uh, I, I think it's going to it's going to have to it's going to have to change. It's going to be um, media companies versus TV stations. So they will be streaming live. They will have over the air. They're going to be on you know different things. So everything everyone will be a media company, and that media company is going to be doing several different ways of reaching the public. Yeah. Can 3D TV save television? No, I don't think so. I'm going to say no. It's not there yet. No. I'm going to say no because uh, I don't think it's there. Yeah, I think the other people say 3D is largely a gimmick, be it on a TV or on my telephone. I'm waiting for some television. Well, they 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 actually think 3D has been one of the saviors for theaters, you know, for uh, for going out to the movie. You know, it's a great experience, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm willing to pay for that. Where I hadn't, you know, gone to movies hardly in years until 3D kind of brought me back in. Avatar. Yeah. Yeah. Avatar. Exactly. Was that, that was my first 3D. Was Avatar. I went to a six-story tall screen with a 30,000 watt sound system at the Seattle Center. I thought I'd seen a movie until I saw that. I hear you. Yeah, and Avatar was a great flick. I, you know what? I, I left Avatar not wanting to see an Avatar too, but I just wanted to walk around that world. You know what I mean? That, that oh, world yeah. or something else. Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you what. We're moving on into a new segment for uh, Tech News Week, and that segment is called... Rumors. Rumors. All right, we're going to talk room, and here's how it works. Everybody get your thumbs up on the, just like this in front of the camera. I'm going to read a rumor that was, uh, that was released this week, and if you go up, you're telling me you're buying the rumor. If your thumb goes down, you're, you're saying this rumor is not going not gonna to happen. Here's the first one. Amazon smartphone in development, says Bloomberg. Okay, uh, looks like uh, guys neutral. Joe's down. Everybody else? Oh no, Chris is down. All right, Chris, why don't you think it's going to happen? Well, um, I think if it does happen, it's going to go like the Facebook phone did. You know, it's not going to. Happen. <laughs> yeah, I think if, if if they do have a phone, um, 
they need to kind of mirror what the Kindle Fire has because if not, then the whole the whole thing about the Kindle Fire is going to be kind of in vain, I think. Okay, Joe, you went down. I, I just don't think they have any experience dealing with telephony, uh, voice chatting, anything that deals with any kind of messenger and communication. They don't even have an email system set up. So why would they think that would be something that they can get into? And let's be honest, what have they done in the past that is with anything that's on a, on a smartphone thing? They just took something that belonged to Android, hacked it up so that you can't access any of the um, Android um, uh, applications and advertisements and says, this is mine. They know how to sell them. Best-selling tablet to date that has been the best-selling Android-based tablet on the market. Not only that, they have they have that plan that you can download over a cellular network the books and stuff. So they already have the technology in place. It's part of the it's part of the the Kindle experience. So it's just the next step is to add a microphone or whatever and uh, natural there. progression, Jeff. Natural progression. I it agree. is the natural progression. They're already doing. They're already yeah. on the cellular network. Yeah, they already have the deal with AT and T. Is it Verizon? For Kindles, and I have a feeling that this Kindle phone is either going to be Android-based with a shrunk-down version of the Kindle UI, you know, from the Kindle Fire, the America Round, or whatever it's called, or it is actually going to be a, based on the Boot to Gecko project, Firefox OS is what it's called now, all HTML5. I could honestly see that being Amazon's main way of delivering their Prime books and all that content to a small, high-powered battery device, you know, or actually lower, underpowered. Yeah. Let, let me ask you know this, I mean. and we're going to move on to the next rumor, but let me ask this. Uh, could, could Amazon change the face of the mobile market if they did something crazy, like uh, gave the phone away? And uh, but you're committed to spending so much on Amazon services on a month, you know, a month-to-month -month basis over a two-year contract. Could could that happen? Now, Don't wouldn't it be great that? that your Amazon Prime membership brought a phone with it? Exactly. Yeah, like a like a certain amount of minutes. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yes, yeah, I can see that happening. Why not? I can see. That. Okay, with that, I can say that might be an incentive for me to want to get one. I can see that happening. That's been a model of the way they do things, you know. Uh, I and it just makes you consume more of their product. Which yeah. is which is the was the whole purpose of the Kindle Fire to start yeah. with. Right. You'll you'll get that phone in two days free shipping. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> of course you will. With one click buying also. Yes. Yeah. Well it's technically not well I guess you have to sign the contract, but Super Saver. All right. All right, this is another rumor. We kind of touched on this really in talking about other things, but I'm going to throw it out here. Get those thumbs up in a neutral position, gang. YouTube reportedly working on adding premium channels in France. Uh, okay, we got Alex down on that one. Guy stayed neutral again. That guy, man, he's, he's working to be a politician, I can tell. <laughs> Alex? Honest, honestly, the reason I don't... It, it depends on what you mean by premium channels. If you're referring to the project that was so-called in the works a couple of years, or actually last year, the YouTube live TV thing that they did before live hangouts, I think, yes, we will see that live streaming content that you may have to pay for in France. Or like... BBC Europe coming to YouTube. That would be amazing, but it would come at a premium. Now, if we're talking premium channels, like either the user or content uploader or the viewer has to we're pay... Talking, to we're talking the about YouTube-specific content that YouTube works with partners to create and uh, basically take uh, you know a television show... And uh, it has producers and stars, and they make it, and it's available only on YouTube. Yeah, I see now. Yeah, that's basically the YouTube TV project that was 
in the works last summer. So, uh, yeah, I see what you're talking about now. I, mean, I, I actually could see that happening. I'm may I say something? My vote, Duke. May, I'm may I say something real quick after after Guy changes his vote? I, it, you know, it isn't uh, Google Plus helping all newscasts be live on YouTube right now. They're giving them that unified box. They're showing them how to do it, and they're streaming live. It's and they're they're going after the newscast like Sarah Hill and the Tahoe. I mean, there's Fox LA. All the Fox stations seem to be doing it. So. Kind of interesting, don't you think? Well, I, I, you know, listen, I, I figured this out. You know, if uh, if YouTube can ever sign a uh, an agreement with NASCAR, Tennessee is going to be all about YouTube. Just let me tell you that, okay? I, I only see two things that they have to do to make this successful. One is good content consumption. If they don't have a good content, nothing is going to matter of it. The second thing is going to happen after they have good content is going to be lawsuits. Every cable provider or any traditional service provider worth their anything is going to start suing the crap out of them as some sort of uh, infringement of something. They're going to be playing hardball and they're going to do it good. The the key is are the judges going to are going to throw it out and say no things are changing or they're going to try and hold on and say no you can't and stronghold the entire deal. But but why why what specifically what lawsuits I mean uh, you know listen if, uh, uh, if I I can make a movie you know and uh, I mean I mean that that content is is all over YouTube now you know there's there's some pretty good content yeah there's there's a whole lot of crap okay but there's some pretty good U uh, content now on YouTube nobody's getting sued necessarily are they. Unless it's copyright infringement. If it becomes popular, you're going to see things the way Apple is is uh, is yeah. suing all of its other manufacturers, uh, other manufacturers that come even close to their competition. Wasn't there a, wasn't there a, something in New York City where this guy is relaying um, live TV to phones, iPhones or something like that, and then they had an injunction against them and it was lifted? Or it, they're allowing this guy to do live TV relayed to phones. Mm -hmm. That's not a far stretch to what everything else is going on. So, my thing is this: is you know we all know by now that Google owns you know YouTube, obviously. Um, and I'm gonna use a picture here because it's it's it speaks for itself. So, right here is the Google Play Market. As you can see, they just implemented their TV and movies uh, section. You know, and uh, I think they're. That if 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 they wanted to, they can make money in both markets. You know, uh, for those of us who don't have a Android device, or even if we have a dumb phone, we can still access all the uh, all the all the you know movies and TV shows through YouTube. Mm -hmm. And it, it would be a profitable market because not only would they be making money in you know the Google Play Store, but they'll also be making money in YouTube. So I think it's a, it's a smart smart thing to do if it were to happen. And, and I think this this topic falls back again. You know, I said it was going to be all about patents and TV when we when we started the broadcast. I, I think this falls back into that TV. I mean, YouTube, YouTube is going after this market, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Hulu's trying to get there. Netflix is doing a pretty good job of getting there. There's a, uh, I'll save some of my Netflix vents for another show, but. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, real quick, I'm just going to mention Google TV. I think uh, Google had a vision for uh, what internet video could be with Google TV, and uh, I think they've fallen well short of uh, of achieving that vision. But uh, because I still can't watch Hulu on my Google TV, and uh, uh, Google, I say that every chance that I get, I sure am frustrated about that. Uh, Kind of wish they'd buy Hulu and put an end to it. Listen, guys, we're going to wrap this up. We've gone over. Uh, we'll try to keep these around 45 minutes we've gone over. So I'm going to wrap this up. I really appreciate you guys. Uh, really uh, hope to uh, see everyone again next week. And uh, uh, everyone just uh, have a good, safe weekend. And we'll do this again Thursday. See you now. I'd like, I'd like to put in a quick note before you uh, <laughs> You've been listening to Tech Newsweek.
a Tech and Coffee weekly series where we get together and discuss all the news and happenings around the world of tech. We would love to have you join us at our Google Plus Hangout. The easiest way for you to do that is to go to techandcoffee.info where you'll find a link to our existing hangout. You can also follow us on Twitter at techandcoffee1 as well as Facebook. You can expect to find a lot of news and information within the world of tech as well as information about our upcoming shows and events. Have a great rest of the week and thank you for listening to Tech News Week. Bye now.